Welcome back to the book of Ruth, the big message in a short story. Last session, we looked at why we study our Bible, why we look at the Old Testament specifically, and some best practices for reading as we move forward. We began the book of Ruth, and we saw that God designed the Israelites to be holy and set apart, unlike their neighboring Canaanite nations, and that they, they, they would take care of their community, especially the most vulnerable among them. We identified the most vulnerable to be the orphan, the widow, and the foreigner. And we left off on this literary peak at Ruth chapter 1, verse 5, and we hoped that the Israelites would listen to God's instructions for their community and take care of the most vulnerable among them being Ruth and Naomi. So before we jump back into our story, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we humbly stand before you and we ask for your wisdom and your guidance as we open your word today. We pray that we let the text speak for itself, that we not read into it our own agenda, thoughts, and opinions. We pray that you would reveal yourself to us today, that we'd walk away with a better understanding of who you are and how you relate to your people. May we be lifelong students of your word, letting it transform us from the inside out. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we have a lot to cover in this session today, so go ahead and grab your Bible and download uh, the handout for session two on our website. So you'll wanna grab those items now and a pen because we'll be taking a lot of notes. Feel free to pause this video to get those items now. Like we said, we began the book of Ruth in the last session. We met a woman named Naomi, whose husband and two sons have just died because of a, of a famine in the land. And before they died, they married two Moabite or Canaanite women, one named Ruth and the other Orpah. And we will jump back in and it's going to be Ruth chapter 1, verse 6. So this is the word of the Lord. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left that place where she'd been living and set out on the road that would take them to the land of Judah. When Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you've shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought that there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me for, than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go back with her, she stopped urging her. Well, this section of Ruth you might be quite familiar with, especially verses 16 and 17. Now, if you've been a Christian a long time, or if you've grown up in the church, or if you've ever heard someone teach on the book of Ruth, this might have been your takeaway from this section. Ruth is good because she is loyal to her mother-in-law and goes with her wherever she goes. And Orpah is bad because she returns back home to her home country and to her gods. And the main takeaway lesson here is to be like Ruth. Well, I would like to offer us an alternative interpretation. Let's go back to verse uh, 10, or rather uh, halfway through 9 and 10. 
It says, uh, and they, meaning Ruth and Orpah, wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. This verse suggests that Orpah also wanted to go back with Naomi. There's this temptation here to uh, demonize Orpah in this story, but she wanted to go. I would suggest that she was being obedient to her mother-in-law, that she was respecting her authority and listening to her wishes um, by going back to her home country. Now, before we move forward, I would like to offer us some guidance for uh, reading biblical narratives. If you've ever heard a sermon where the main lesson or takeaway was to be like X biblical character, I would urge you to be very wary of this teaching. When it comes to reading and understanding biblical narratives, it's helpful to be reminded of, of the fact that no Bible narrative was written about us, the modern Christian. The Joseph narrative is about Joseph and specifically about how God carried out his divine plan through him, not us. <laughs> In the same way, Ruth's narrative glorifies God's provision and protection and blessing for Ruth and the Bethlehemites, not us. And we can always learn a great deal from all the Bible's narratives, but we can never expect that God wants us to do exactly the th same things that the Bible characters did or have the same things happen to us as happened to them. We, we have to remember that Bible characters are sometimes good and sometimes they're evil. Sometimes they're wise and sometimes they're foolish. Sometimes they are well off and sometimes they're miserable. And so the first fill in on your handout is, is this. Narratives are precious to us because they so vividly demonstrate God's involvement in the world and illustrate his principles and calling. I have included a list of 10 principles for reading and understanding biblical narratives. And it's from a very famous book called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. You should definitely check it out. For the sake of time, I'm only going to highlight two of those principles from the list, but I ask that you go back and read through the list as we move forward in our study of the book of Ruth. Ruth. So the first principle is this. Old Testament narratives illustrate a doctrine or doctrines that are taught elsewhere in scripture. So if the theological application that you're walking away with is not talked about or, or affirmed elsewhere in scripture, I would ask that you go back and reevaluate. Follow the observation, interpretation, and application guidelines that we talked about in our last session and run your lesson by a, a pastor or a student of the Bible to make sure that you're on the right track again. So that's the first lesson, the principle. The second principle is this, and it's very important. God is the hero of every Bible narrative. Every story serves the purpose of demonstrating how God is working and moving in the lives of his people and how he loves his people so dearly. So those are the two principles. Let's jump back to uh, Ruth chapter one because there is something to be gleaned here from Ruth's response to Naomi. Let's read verses 16 and 17 again. Verse 16, this is the word of the Lord. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. It's made very clear here that Ruth's responses to Naomi's two urges uh, for her to return home are so sincere. We read in verse 14 that she physically holds on to her or clings to her, cleaves to her. And the theological discussion here is so interesting because Naomi knows that if Ruth and Orpah were to return home to their country and um, they would definitely be returning home to their gods. And Ruth does so with full knowledge. You know, we could focus on the fact that they have this sweet relationship and Ruth wanted to go because she didn't want to leave her. But there is so much more than that here. 
she knows the the the, the outcome of the 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 decision that she is making. Her identity will change. Naomi's people will be her people and she's accepting the fact that she will die and be buried away from her birthplace and her own people. But most importantly, Naomi's God will be her God. And verse 17 actually gives us an indication that that Ruth knew um, about Naomi's God. She knew who she was going to to um, devote herself to. And we know this because of her, of the way that she addresses him. She uses the word Elohim. And Elohim is a Hebrew word that appears in the first sentence of our Bible. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Now, Ruth would have been very familiar with the other ancient Mesopotamian uh, creation narratives circulating at the time. You know, it's often, um, we might think that Genesis is the only creation narrative out there, but in fact, it, there were very similar stories of other gods bringing the world into existence. And so Ruth calling God by Elohim, she's essentially rejecting the other creation narratives that she would have been familiar with, especially the one of her own people and, and her own people's uh, gods creating the world, right? And so Elohim, she's acknowledging that God is the one who created the heavens and the earth and separated light from darkness and land from sea and, and night from day, that he is the one true God in Elohim, she's acknowledging his authority, his creative power, and his sovereignty. And so in the first act of this book, this is the next villain on your handout, Ruth is joining Naomi's family, not by marriage this time, but by a covenantal agreement to both Naomi and to God. She chooses to be a part of God's people, identifying herself as an Israelite now. And what we know from reading elsewhere in scripture is that when someone acknowledges God's sovereignty and identifies themselves to be a part of God's family, they are now included under God's hand of provision and blessing. And, and so we know, this is as students of the book of Ruth, we know that God will provide for and provide protect Ruth, and ultimately include her in his divine plan for blessing the nations of the world. Well, that's act one. We are now moving to act two. And in act one, you know, Naomi was the main player. She was the key character. And uh, even though she's going to be uh, significant throughout the, the, the chapters to come, we're going to shift our focus from Naomi to uh, Ruth and a man named Boaz and their specific interactions between them. It's so important before we move forward to clarify the relationship between Ruth and Boaz. You might have heard before, you know, Ruth is a lovely romantic story or Ruth is perfect material for a women's conference. And friends, I, there is so much more. We already know that there's so much more here than just that. I know for me, in my story growing up in the church, I didn't really hear about the book of Ruth. The main thing that I would hear about would be Ruth and Boaz. And, and women would say, I would hear women say, you know, I'm searching for my Boaz or, or phrases similar to this, uh, really to instruct or encourage women to find godly men to date or eventually marry. Well, Ruth, like we said, is does not serve the purpose to instruct us on how to find godly men to date or marry. We model ourselves after after Christ himself, what God teaches us teaches us about who he is and how he relates to his people. We're not looking to Ruth to try and decode how to find, you know, Boaz-like qualities in modern men today. One of my favorite scholars on the book of Ruth uh, says this. She says, Ruth can be described as a book about the marginalized, in particular, destitute widows and foreigners. And although it can be very helpfully used to encourage and validate those in that category, it would be a travesty to treat it only as that. The lessons of Ruth are just as important and perhaps even more necessary for the wealthy and powerful men of Israel as they were for poor women. And so I encourage us to, to treat Ruth 
as that. Not a book about, you know, women trying to find somebody to date or marry, or even to encourage uh, vulnerable people. But let's hold Ruth in its proper place as a book for all people and all social and economic standings, carrying a message of hope, uh, provision, and protection from the one true God, Yahweh. So with this in mind, let's continue on in our reading. Let's go to Ruth chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So what do we observe about this uh, section here, these first three verses? Well, we know that a man named Boaz has just entered the scene, and he's described as a man of standing. In other translations, he's called a man of great wealth, that's in the NASB, a worthy man in the ESV, and a prominent man of noble character in the CSB. All of these translations come from the Hebrew word chayil, referring to the results of moral character or the results of physical character, such as wealth or success in battle. In Boaz's case, uh, he's, he has the physical characteristics, right, of, of wealth because he's sharing um, everything that he has with the poor, but it's mostly about his, his moral character because of his devotion to Yahweh and his commandments. He's letting people glean his fields, the, the, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, uh, glean his fields. So he is respecting the commandment of Deuteronomy 24, 19 that we read in the last session. So that's the first thing that we gained from that, from those three first three verses, is that that Boaz is faithful to Yahweh and his commandments. That's number one. Number two, we learn that he's from the clan of Elimelech. Now, if you remember that name, this is Naomi's this is Naomi's husband, a former husband who has just died. And so we're identifying number one, Boaz. Uh, is faithful to the Lord and to his commandments. And number two, he is a part of Naomi and Ruth's family. And we get excited about this fact because we hope that Boaz will become what the Bible refers to as, the Old Testament refers to as the guardian redeemer or the kinsman redeemer. Let's go to Ruth uh, chapter 2, verse 19 and 20 to read a little bit more about what this means. Um, so Ruth chapter 19 and 20, this is the word of the Lord. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she'd been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and to the dead. She added, this man is our close relative. He's one of our guardian redeemers. The Hebrew word for guardian redeemer or kinsman redeemer in this text is goel. And it's a term that's used uh, to describe one who has the obligation to redeem a relative in serious difficulty. The responsibilities of the goel are are listed throughout the, the book of the law, so the first five books of our Bible. And I've uh, included a list on your handout, uh, five responsibilities, and I'll read them for you now. So follow along with me on your handout. Number one, the kinsman redeemer would repay any wrong done by a relative. They would avenge a murder of a relative, pay for a relative who's been forced into debt slavery, purchase family property that, because of poverty or death, could be sold outside the family. And this is actually what happens in Ruth chapter 4, which we'll uh, read in the next session. And five, deliver a member of one's kinship group from harm or misfortune of any kind. And what I can't get out of my head when I read this list is that there is no indication in the text that Boaz 
had any idea of Ruth's family history when she left uh, Bethlehem to live in Moab. For all he knew, he could have had to, you know, pay for a relative who was forced into debt slavery or avenge a murder. He, he only agreed to be the guardian redeemer because of his faithfulness to Yahweh and his commandments, not just to follow, you know, a list of rules, but because he loves God and he wanted to be faithful. We know this is an act of covenantal loyalty because of Ruth uh, 20, um, chapter 2, verse 20. And this is what Naomi says to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and to the dead. And your Bible might say either a devotion or loyalty. The NIV says um, kindness. And it's uh, the Hebrew word hesed. Hesed is so important throughout the Bible. And it means covenantal loyalty as an act of love. That's the next fill-in on your handout. It's most often referring to the character of God. This is so important here. So in order to really understand this fully, Hesed, I want us to turn back to Exodus 34, verse 4. And while you're turning there, I would love to set the scene for you. So God has just delivered the Israelites out of slavery and bondage and Egypt, and he is bringing them into the wilderness, and he is going to teach them about how to live as God's covenant people. So he's giving Moses the Ten Commandments inscribed on tablets of stone. And this is what he says. This is the word of the Lord. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones, went up to Mount Sinai and early in the morning. And as the Lord commanded him, he carried the two stone tablets in his hand. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. He passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Let's skip down to verse 10. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you before all your people. I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I've commanded today. This phrase in reference to God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, is the Hebrew word chesed. And it's also translated um, to be abounding in faithfulness and truth in the NASB, abounding in steadfast love in the ESB, and abounding in faithful love and truth in the CSB. It's a term that refers to the marriage between God's faithfulness and God's love. I want us to hear something today. God is a faithful God because he is holy and righteous and just, and it goes against everything in his nature to break a covenant promise. But God is not faithful simply because of his nature. He is faithful because he loves us. Let me put it this way. The the thought that someone would stay in a relationship with me out of an obligation to a promise they made that thought, it it would break my heart. I would want them to stay because they want to stay. It's the same way with God. I want to know that God is not just faithful to me because he is a faithful God and he doesn't break his promises. I want to know that there is a measurable affection for me. I want you to know that God is not just staying with you and not letting go of you because he is faithful to his promises, although he is. He is also faithful to you because he loves you and does not want to let you go. That fidelity and affection is something that you and I and our sin cannot break. It seals the covenant promise. There is nothing that we could do to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So I'm going to read a psalm for us um, about this marriage between God's covenant faithfulness and God's love for us, the perfect marriage. And I I want you to close your Bible. I want the words to wash over you. I want them to, the, the truth of the words to sink deep into your heart today. 
So this is going to be um, Psalm 103 and feel free to close your eyes um, and just think about the words that, um, that you hear. So this is the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor, his, he will, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we're dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows it over and it's gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. Friends, I hope this encourages you today. I hope you see that the Lord is faithful to you because he is a faithful God and he does not break his promises. But he also loves you. He knows you by name. He, he forgives your sins. He heals your diseases and redeems you from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. He delights in who you are. So this is where we will conclude our session today. And I hope that you see that Ruth, we're only scratching the surface of, of what this beautiful book contains. I hope you're starting to see the message of hope that it brings. So I look forward to our discussion online via Google Meet, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for viewing the teaching online. Please join us for a time of discussion beginning at 6.30 p.m. To join, visit our Wednesday night at Shoreline online page on our website and click join discussion for this Wednesday night's class discussion on the book of Ruth. We're so excited to spend some time with all of you reflecting on the things that we have learned from this teaching. We'll see you then.